I am a solution, yeah. That's Good evening, my name. ladies and gentlemen. I am your host. My name is Ulfla Augustine. Welcome to the 2023 Viewfort Emancipation Lecture that I uh, know that you guys are anticipating. It's entitled, The Politics of St. Lucia from George F.L. Charles to Philip Jean-Pierre. It will be about the implications for freedom by economist, author, public, intellectual, and view for its very own, Dr. Anderson Reynolds. I'm also pleased to say that to help us celebrate the evening in St. Lucian style, we have here with us Nintas McGray. Let's, uh, let's give him a, a welcome. To serenade the evening. Earlier, we, we, we were supposed to have had um, uh, a vote service, but we haven't seen them yet. So let's hope that uh, we see Mr. Ernest, Minister Ernest. He should be on his way. He's on. Oh, okay, okay. So he's very close. He will be here, thank goodness. <laughs> yes. So uh, we shall have um, Minister Dr. Ernest Hilaire to motivate and officially launch the event. After the lecture, historian and adopted view fortune, Dr. Jolene Hampson, who is in the audience right here, to my left. Yes, let's give her a round of applause. Yeah. She will provide perspectives with closing remarks or comments. And then you, the audience, will have the opportunity to provide feedback in the form of questions, comments, or discussions that you may want to say something about. In keeping with the theme of the lecture, we have on display a collection of books that you could browse through. They're right here. And in the back, we have some books as well. Uh, Dr. Reynolds, six books are also on display, all of which are on sale tonight at a special price of 50 bucks, $50 EC. So before you leave here tonight, don't forget to get your autograph copies of Dr. Reynolds' books. As was the case with the, the Viewfort uh, book launch, I don't know how many of you were able to be present, but um, uh, Dr. Reynolds, he did launch a book called, they called him Brother George, it's right here. And um, uh, tonight's lecture is part of an attempt to change the narrative on Viewfort to one of positive and uplifting engagements. We all have heard of certain incidents that took place that were not very nice, and we know that we need to change that. So Dr. Reynolds is trying to make an attempt to, you know, to change the script. As such, the lecture represents the start of a Jacko Productions collabor in collaboration with the recently launched initiative, Seeds for Justice, Peace, and Economic Prosperity in St. Lucia. That beginning in Viewfort seeks to engender the positive socioeconomic transformation of St. Lucian communities. Folks, we know that violence is all around the world, but we would like to start to make a change. And for those of us who can make a change, we need to try and do what we can. 
All right, if you know something, say something, but you must say to the right persons and do the right thing. In continuation of emancipation, commemoration of emancipation, Dr. Reynolds will conduct a special book signing this Saturday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. at Massey's Mega in um, Castries, Shock Bay. And the next month, as he did in 2017 uh, and 2018, with the publication of uh, The Stallkeeper, which we have over here. When you get, you get a chance to look at that too. Dr. Reynolds will embark on an international book tour of They Called Him Brother George. It's the portrait of a Caribbean politician. Those of you who are in your, I would say, 50s, you know who Brother George is, don't you? A show of hands for those of you who know who Brother George is. Raise your hands. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So uh, the, the portrait of a Caribbean politician who is Brother George. On this tour, he will be visiting several CARICOM countries and several North American and UK cities. Oh, Dr. Reynolds is going places. That's a good thing. Let's give him a big hand. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're still waiting for um, Dr. Ernest Hillier. We should be here anytime. Okay. So would we uh, welcome Nintas McGray right now? I'm going to give you a little write-up on him. We would like to call on uh, Nintas McGray, the 2012 St. Lucia Calypso monarch, to serenade the evening. He hails from Deriso. He is perhaps St. Lucia's most energetic entertaining and versatile artist would you say that yeah i think so too let's let's get, welcome him let's welcome him yeah he is equally at home in a calypso tent as in a concert hall accompanied by a big band orchestra it just so happened that this morning what a coincidence i met this man at a workshop and I'm supposed to be introducing him and I didn't realize that he was the one I met at the workshop. I heard his name, I, but I just let this pass by and I'm like, who is Nintas? And he was right there. So here we are. We have this young man who is very talented and is ready to uh, entertain us. Uh, he's a featured artist in this year's St. Lucia Jazz and Arts Festival as well. And he is an artist with the talent and potential to represent St. Lucia at the highest levels of world music. So let's welcome this young man. Lani Adobagay Mwetan, la concerne di mwema materi mimsav. Thank you very much. Since we had not used any Creole, I felt that it was important, Creole being a vehicle of emancipation in itself. So when you hear African tunes like, Mani, mani, ma bo, mani, ma, mani, mani, ma bo, mani, ma, zao ye, zao ye, mani, ma, kapala pala timpo, mani, ma, kapala pala timpo, mani, ma, mani, mani, ma bo, mani, ma, mani, mani, ma bo, mani, ma, zao ye, zao ye, mani, ma, kapala pala timpo, mani, ma, kapala pala timpo, mani, ma. You know that. Africanism and St. Lucianism and our culture is very present and alive. And um, we need to, every time we get an opportunity, remind ourselves that we have an identity. We, we are a people. And emancipation would have done an injustice where a lot of what we are and knew was being suppressed. 
my journey is to find for myself in my short life how true I can be to what I am, what I was, and what I can be. And I try to inspire others to be conscious. If you give me some music, I will sing the song that I wrote with that particular flavor. Um, we'll use the track. We'll use the, the song because the track, the guy couldn't send it to me. So go ahead, sir. I am no la mama Benny Cheo I am no la mama Benny Cheo I am no la mama To those who never sat in parliament in your image, we built no monument. But somewhere in the shadows lives our heroes. In each dream that they built reminds us that we will do in my own life. So this word is my bond. A nation gets a fighting chance to win. Mama, Benny Jayo, Benny O, Benny O, Benny O. I am no la Mama, Benny O. The architects to what we have become. The first builders of Helen's great kingdom. I want you to know if you are here, you are heroes. Though the bill is passed on, the legacy through us lives on. This word is my bond. We're resilient, so let's live on. I am no la a fan of ton make. Messi, messi, messi. Amase la ne. Messi, messi, messi. Apa Joseph Inglis. Messi, messi, messi. Ama, ama mada yes. Messi, 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 messi. Amase la ne. Messi, messi, messi. This nation is my nation. Benny O. This nation of people, this land that I adore, there's no one I'd rather be more. I am no lie. Benny J. O. Benny J. O. Benny O, Benny O, Benny O, Benny O. Ooh. Benny J O, Benny O. I am no la. Benny O, Benny O. Bless their hearts, bless their hearts. Benny O, Benny O. Our heroes, Benny O, Benny O. I am no la. I am no la. I am no la. Benny O, Benny O, Benny O. Messi, Messi, Messi. Thank you very much, Nintas. Indeed, I just discovered your big talents. Let's give him a big round of applause again. Yes, thank you so much. He has that wonderful natural singing voice that when I look at um, uh, the voice uh, from Britain, Britain got talent, America's got talent, um, Singapore's got talent, we should have a St. Lucia's got talent show. So that's yours. You got to do it. 
All right, thank you again. Uh, now we would like to introduce the man of the hour, Dr. Anderson Reynolds. He's an award-winning author, as you can see, one of St. Lucia's top public intellectuals and most prominent and prolific authors, who, with the publication of They Called Him Brother George, the portrait of a Caribbean politician now has six books under his belt. By way of introduction, we invite you to sit back and enjoy a brief video that speaks to Dr. Reynolds' literary journey and body of work. Let's welcome Minister. All right? You could come over. You could come forward. I, I was just... Um, you can come forward. Yeah. Yes, you can come forward, Dr. Sir. Okay. So we're ready. Presentation. Dr. Reynolds' writing, be it fictional or non-fictional, has been described as a world in which a great drama unfolds, where history, geography, nature, culture, the supernatural, and socio-economic factors all combine to seal the fate of characters, communities, or for that matter, the fate of whole nations or civilizations. In this crucible of a world, readers are provided with deep insights into where St. Lucians come from, who they are as a people, and how they became who they are. His first book, the novel Death by Fire, presents a world plagued by supernatural malevolence, natural and man-made catastrophes, and the vagaries and unkindness of history. In the presence of these life-changing forces, the novel follows the lives of two boys being raised by single parents as they pursue a life of escalating crime. As such, the book presents a sociological contemplation on the root causes of poverty and deprivation and posits that sometimes the neglect of a child produces nearly the same fate as the hatred of a child. His second book, the Struggle for Survival, a historical, political, and socio-economic perspective of St. Lucia, retells the story of the tragic 1993 island-wide banana strike that culminated in the shooting death of two banana farmers. However, by going beyond the tragedy and delving into the island's history, farmers' struggles against droughts, hurricanes, falling prices, corrupt institutions and multinational corporations, we see a microcosm of the struggles of a people against slavery, colonialism, imperialism, dispossession, marginalization and natural calamities. Against the backdrop of American World War II occupation of Beaufort and the damaged culture the occupation wrought, Dr. Reynolds' third book and second novel, The Stallkeeper, examines the lives of the town's inhabitants as they struggle to find love, acceptance, and material success. In so doing, the novel presents a meditation on the nature of fate and offers food for thought on why Beaufortians are the way they are. Dr. Reynolds' fourth book, the memoir My Father is No Longer There, was inspired by his father's accidental death. He said that the book was an attempt to reconcile himself to his father's sudden and premature death and to get to know him better than when he was alive. The book presents a meditation on the nature of death, the value of a life, and the nature of art and creativity. It is an exploration of family values, the depths of parental love and sacrifice, and the importance of parent-child bonding. In his fifth book, No Man's Land, A Political Introspection of St. Lucia, Dr. Reynolds dissects St. Lucian politics and society to pinpoint what is wrong with the country's political system and how to fix it. The book speaks to the hold history has on the country and how race, partisanship, provincialism and opportunism cloud the political process. It is a meditation on issues of patrimony, sovereignty, nationhood, corruption and political empowerment. In this world of Anderson Reynolds, is there any escape or any hope of rising above circumstances of birth and geography? 
Well, maybe. A hint of an answer is provided in the struggle for survival, where the narrator says, But refusing to take a page from history, farmers went on a strike and history repeated itself. So, in the world of Anderson Reynolds, knowledge and understanding of one's history and culture represent the only possible means of escape from one's fate. In other words, man, know thyself and do thyself no harm. But even so, there are no guarantees. For in the Stallkeeper, Ruben was well equipped with a knowledge of history and culture, yet do. this did not prevent his yeah. downfall. Present. Yeah. Okay, so we would like to um, uh, call on uh, Minister Hilaire to the podium so that he could do his presentation. Thank you. All right, so I'm supposed to. Yeah, so yeah, so we are here. We are pleased and honored to to invite the Honorable Dr. Uh, Ernest Hilaire, both in the capacity of Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture, and Information, to motivate and officially launch the evening with brief remarks. Uh, besides his involvement in St. Lucian politics and governance. Dr. Hillier has served St. Lucia as High Commissioner to the United Kingdom and has served the Caribbean region as the Chief Executive Officer of the West Indies Cricket Board. Is that so? <laughs> With a double university major in political science and sociology, and so far with his excellent and applaudable efforts and success at expanding and professionalizing St. Lucia's cultural presentations, I think Dr. Hille is ideally suited to motivate a discussion on freedom and St. Lucian politics. Would you come forward now, please? <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. Let me say good evening to all of you. Um, let me apologize for being late. Um, I think a combination of factors conspired against us. First, there were two big containers on the road um, that held up the traffic, and then we went the wrong side of your fort. But I did call and got directions and found myself here. Um, we went by Spartan University um, instead of coming straight here. <clears throat> I mean, I, I really was delighted to get the invitation to come here. It's not very often that you get discussions of matters such as this and to actually have intellectual and scholastic discussions where people can discuss ideas and share views and opinions on aspects of our civilization. And it's rare in St. Lucia now. Public lectures and public discussions are not um, as exciting as Carnival on the Road. Um, so you can imagine when you do get an opportunity um, to have and to be part of a discussion, uh, it is certainly welcome. And I drove from Castries, certainly looking forward to hear the discussion. I, would have loved to, to, to be here, not so much as a politician, a minister, and everything else, but as a student of St. Lucian politics, West Indian politics, and really international politics. I mean, my years of research, my own academic background centers around in international politics and international economics, and how it has affected post-colonial states like ours. Um, so I have a deep interest in post-colonial studies, and of course I did my PhD um, on that very you know, same issue. So um, I would love to engage in the academic discourse and dialogue and not be shackled by the responsibility of being a politician and more so a minister who's a member of government. And when I saw the topic for tonight, uh, my boss happens to be one of the people um, that is 
shown on the, the flyer. How can I stand here and do a critic of my boss, lest that I be sent home tomorrow as a minister of government? Um, also included was Dr. Kenya Anthony, who um, is a person I have tremendous admiration for, having served as his attache um, when he won elections in 1997. And we spent a lot of time together talking and certainly learned a lot from him and whatnot. And George Odlam is, is another, somebody I knew quite well as a, as a young activist. Um, so for me, it's a really exciting opportunity to hear the discourse on the contributions of those various individuals to shaping West um, St. Lucian um, political um, culture. Um, I must say to Dr. Reynolds that he's very, very ambitious in the work that he does. Um, no, he, he has to be. It's not, you know, there, there are not many people. There are not many people who are trying to write and document and analyze our political evolution. Um, it's, it's not really happening. And when you do find somebody who is not just thinking about it, and we're not being normative, we're not saying right or wrong, is a statement of fact that you're thinking about it, you're writing about it, and you're putting it out in the public domain for, for, for discourse. And who are the people doing that in St. Lucia? Who are the people doing research? And who are the people writing and putting forward, you know, real, um, you know, factual content? Or even when one interprets history, because in many instances, history comes down to interpretations. How does one look at an established historical fact, puts it in context, and then assesses the impact that it has had. It still comes down to some um, subjectivity um, on the part of the, the, the writer. And you have to be brave in the first instance to, to, to want to, to say so. Some people say you almost arrogate yourself the right to interpret history. Um, but that's what we need from intellectuals uh, and certainly academics to so take historical facts, bring them together, analyze them, and present them for the, the pub public discourse. So you're a very ambitious person to do what you're doing. Um, there are not many people doing it, so I need to applaud you um, for doing it. Uh, the second thing is that in this age when, ironically, social media has really brought about a democratization of information and communication, we can all say that, you can go to Google and get information just about anything. Some of it is not correct, but a lot of it is. And anybody can say anything. In the old days, if somebody wants to report a story, they call the television station. The television station will do its own fact-checking. Is, is that true? Did somebody fight down the road? Did somebody do something down the road before they carry it? You go on Facebook and you just write, Anderson punch a woman in view for this morning. And that's it. it, it it's seen by the entire world. Nobody is fact-checking whether that happened for true or not. It is stated, it's broadcasted, and it's broadcast further than even traditional media used to. Now, there's a form of democratization in that. It means everybody now has the power to communicate and to share their perspective. But it also now demands more critical thinking because so much of what is being posted and put out in the public discourse, you know, where is the critical claim of it? So when you are actually writing, documenting through, through um, the publishing of books, um, it really causes you to ensure that what you are presenting is factual, and even though your interpretation might be different, that you can be held up to a certain standard of, of, of you know, the, con the quality of the content that you put forward. So I, I'm really excited that you continue to do what you're doing. You've written a number of books, and it doesn't seem like you're going to stop soon. So I, mean, I want to encourage you to continue to write and, and to encourage other St. Lucians to write as well. I'm very sure you're not making millions out of those books. And maybe in some instance, it's a loss to you because many people don't buy books like before. Um, and certainly it, it takes a lot of personal sacrifice and commitment for you to continue to do what you do. Then there's the aspect of, you know, the, the value of the interpretation you bring to historical facts. You know, if you're going to write about Kenny Anthony, um, Philip J. Pierre, John Compton, uh, and the others, um, you are interpreting. And I've learned in, in this business that 
And that's why I have to start getting very careful about how I say uh, uh, certain things. Sometimes people on the outside interpret manifestations, decisions, actions differently to you, the actor. Because you're the actor. You're the one participating in the decision making. And the full story never comes out sometimes. And people see, well, that particular incident happened. And they analyze all the reasons why it may have happened and the consequences of it happening. But the actors who are involved sometimes have their own interpretation of what happened and how it happened. And I can give you many examples. You know, there was, for example, under Kenny Anthony, the firing of the free senators, Pat Joseph, Rick Wayne, and, and Tessa Mangala. And there's been so many versions of what really happened and how it happened including from Rick Wayne himself. I happened to be part of the discussions that took place, you know, with Dr. Anthony when he was Prime Minister and the, and the senior members of his cabinet. And it's totally different to what has been presented on one side. But I'm sure the true story never comes out in a sense. So it's now left to persons largely on the outside, like yourself, to interpret historical facts. George Odlam is a classic case of this. I've read the book about um, George, whatnot, um, and sometimes the way your experience, not you, but people's experiences with George and what they saw of George and the value of George might be totally different with people who work in the trenches with George. Now, I'm not saying George was not good, was good or bad. So you would see the romantic George, the beautiful speaker, his ability to mobilize and to enlighten people. But then there are those who tell you, you know how many times you so beg George, let's just go on the ground, let's go and meet people, let's organize, let's organize, because that's the pathway to victory. But he couldn't be disciplined to do so, because he was not the, the classic organizer, but as a mobilizer, he was fantastic. As an orator, he was by excellence. But there's the other side, but nobody talks about that, because we are all enamored and endeared by what we saw. Um, and then... There are other actors as well. Julian Hunt, for example, who was probably the best, best organizer I ever worked with, you know, as an activist. I mean, Julian Hunt, you had this, and I'm sure maybe Cassie Elias, you know, can share his own views on, on some of those individuals as an organizer. And Julian Hunt was the one who brought back the Labour Party after the demise of the 79-82 period. By 84, Julian Hunt had become leader and within three years, we moved from the debacle of 1782 to two 98 elections in 1987 because the Labour Party was supremely organized. Now, somebody on the outside looking at a Julian Hunt and doing an account of Julian Hunt in politics may see a different side. You would never see that brilliant organizer, that person who is able to go on the ground and put up the structures, the political structures to move people to to vote and to support the party. So I'm saying all of that to tell you, um, when you, as a writer, and certainly someone who's interpreting political history, you really run a dangerous course because you, know, you are writing it from a certain perspective. As an academic, it becomes slightly, if you go full academic, it becomes slightly different because you know, if you're going to write as an academic, there's a lot of scholarship and a lot of citing of documents and citing of, of incidents and what are your primary sources, your secondary sources, um, and who you're quoting as authorities for your analysis and the, all the um, you know, frameworks for analysis that you establish. So you know, it becomes slightly different. Um, I'm looking forward to tonight to hear what it is that is going to be presented. Um, like I said, some of the individuals, I've had my own experiences with them. Um, I've been, you know, working with them and I have seen some of the strengths and weaknesses. Um, some of them you can never really say publicly because of the confidence of the space you shared with those individuals. But I really like what you're doing. I, I really do. And I think the more we can get people to, to write uh, and to put forward for this course, and only recently you spoke about professionalization of culture, the Archbishop Penny's opinion on carnival. I'm sure some of you may have read what the Archbishop wrote. You did, right? How many of you, have, how many of you read it, what the Archbishop wrote? 
um, not many of you, but you probably should read it, um, his reflections on carnival. And I've been tempted a few times to write something as well. Um, but I think people who would advise me as minister don't do that. Um, but it's, it's a really interesting topic for us to examine what is culture, what is expression. And, and not that he's wrong, I actually was very happy the Archbishop shared his reflections because the more we get that kind of discourse, um, the richer the society becomes and more people should enter into that discourse. What is culture? Should carnival be, you know, traditional, a lot of clothes, a cold pot on your head and on the street just marching or is carnival more expressionism and anyone who wants to reflect creativity in their own interpretation to do so? I mean, if I pick a theme and I say that my theme is um, a city's death by fire and I'm putting out a ban and I'm going to have five sections. The first section will be all red costume, red signifying fire and then a lot of feathers to show it and then the second section might be less red, maybe some black but more skimpy because the fire has laid bare the city, everything has been burned. You don't have to have a lot of clothes on you. So you, you, you get, you know what I'm saying? Now that's my, thought, my thinking. That's how I want to express a theme as it is death by fire. So who says because you've taken off the clothes and you have a bikini and a bra, then that's not culture anymore? But what if every section I present in terms of color and design and the use of feathers and whatnot, I'm carrying my theme. And who says that that, that is scandalous? And what you really need to have is more twirl on you, more clothes, and only then it's culture. Who says so? But we need to engage in that kind of debate because there are people that say it must be traditional and it should not go the other direction. A younger generation wants to go the other direction. The other generation, you think you could tell them they must only wear, you know, a lot of twirl? They don't. They, they, they're comfortable in their bodies and whatnot. So, there's a lot. I'm looking forward to tonight, and I hope the audience is looking forward to tonight. Um, and let's have an exciting night. Thank you for having me. And certainly, I'm really pleased I was invited. Thanks. You're welcome, Dr. Hilaire. Dr. Minister Hilaire. <laughs> if I have to put all the accolades. All right, let's give him a big round of applause again, please. So without further ado, we need to get Dr. Anderson right up here. So if you don't mind, you are next. Dr. Anderson, let's come on. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to our commemoration of 2023 um, emancipation. Thank you very much, Dr. Hiller, for your kind words. Um, I've, I've been um, I've been saying um, you are, that you have been doing a great job with our culture. <laughs> um, the way events are now being organized. I'm saying um, they are doing it even better than I would do it. <laughs> um, so, so keep up the good works. Um, I also, I think it was great we went back to our, the expanded um, version of St. Lucia Jazz. I call it the more democratic <laughs> um, present, jazz, present, uh, jazz presentation. People, St. Lucians are still discussing, st still um, talking about we are not independent, we are not emancipated. The other day one guy told me, well, how, how can we be, say we are independent or we are emancipated when we're still depending on England and the US for aid and so forth and so on. 
So the issue of whether we are independent, the issue of whether we are fully emancipated is still under discussion. So tonight, what, what I want to do is to briefly trace the history of St. Lucian politics, point out how the freedom of the populace has changed over time, and explore to what extent we are on slide two, and to explore um, to what extent our various political leaders have fostered or advanced the notion of freedom. I think it is in order to provide definitions, what do we mean by freedom? We have personal freedom, which I will define as having equal access to the opportunities and resources of the country, and subject to the rights of others, having the unhindered ability to think, decide, and act on what one deems is in one's best interest, including but not limited to the affairs of religion, economics, and politics. We have state freedom, which I define as having the autonomy to implement policies and programs and pursue courses of action deemed in the best interests of the people, the populace, free of constraints and coercion from external forces and entities, or not having or needing to give sway to external forces and entities conflicting with domestic imperatives. So, to have state freedom, our government um, must have the autonomy, the freedom to design, implement policies that are in our best interests and not policies and programs dictated by external forces, um, by World Bank, IMF, um, the US, Western Europe. So, so, the, so the extent to which we have that autonomy to, to govern in the best interest of our people unconstrained by those external factors is the extent to which I would say we have state freedom. Um, towards the latter part of the lecture, a lot of the analysis I'm, I'm going to do present is from Dr. T Tennyson Joseph's um, book um, on St. Lucian politics. And one of the terms that comes that is, he repeats quite often in his book is neoliberalism, global li or global neoliberalism. Now, neoliberalism have been defined as an economic philosophy advocating unfettered markets, minimal state intervention in socio-economic affairs, and freedom of trade and capital flow as imperative to sustain economic growth and human progress. So it's a, it's a philosophy that says government should stay out of the economy. Um, we must have, the market must reign supreme. We must have free flow of capital, free flow of, of labor uh, and so forth. And there must be very little government intervention in the market. Now, to the extent that we buy into global neoliberalism, in the eyes of Dr. Joseph, we are constraining our freedom. Um, neoliberalism, have, it has been said it limits the autonomy of small individu individual states to pursue independent domestic agendas and prioritizes the requirements of global capital above domestic needs. So neoliberalism constrains the autonomy of governments to, to do what they think is best for the people. Uh, and it, it puts ahead of domestic requirements, it puts the requirements of international capital. It prioritizes that international capital ahead of the needs of the 
of, of, of the country. So again, based on our definition of freedom, to the extent that the St. Lucia is following or accepting the, or the notion or have bought into the notion of neoliberalism is the, is the extent to which we are not free. So if we, ask, if we buy these definitions, um, then let's continue. <laughs> So we are, we are down to slide seven. Slavery, or part one, emancipation, the great irony. And we are down to slide seven. Now St. Lucia, emancipation came in 1838. And as you could well imagine, there was great jubilation, great celebration, but no sooner the, our ancestors were emancipated, I think they suffered great disappointment. To begin with, it wasn't the slaves, the emancipated slaves, the former slaves that received reparation for all the cruelty and all the free labor they gave. It was the plantocracy the plantation owners that received reparation. They argued that since it was because England legislated for slavery, legitimatized slavery, that is why they invested in slave capital. So now that England is freeing up the slaves, changing the, the legislation regarding slavery, they, need, they ought to be compensated for giving up their slave capital. England agreed. So the, the UK gave St. Lucian slave owners a total of 342,155 pounds for 13,285 emancip emancipated slaves. The, the money they gave, the reparation in today's money would come to about $50 million. So first, it wasn't the former slaves that received reparation. It was the slave owners. Second, as soon as emancipation took place, the plantocracy teamed up with the government, the authority at the time, to make sure they continue enjoying a large pool of, of, um, of cheap labor, almost where the former slaves would continue working in all, under almost the same conditions as, as slavery. So how did they go about trying to ensure um, that they continue getting a cheap source of, of labor? Well, all the, the slaves, during slavery, the, some of the slaves received, um, of course, the plantation provide housing like the huts they lived in, and also, the plantation sometimes gave them plots of land where they grew their own food. So after emancipation, the plantation owners told the former slaves that if you all are refusing to work for us at the wages we want to pay you all, on, when we want you all to work, then we will have to evict you all from those plots or you all will be forced to pay rent. Now, because St. Lucia is very hilly, a, a, a lot of the land wasn't on the plantation, plantation uh, sugar plantation, um, sugar cultivation. So, a lot of the slaves could, a, a lot of the former slaves left the plantation and went up in the hills to grow their own food on crown lands and so forth. So, so the, so many of them chose to do without working for the plantations. Of course, on, this, was, this is very much unlike Barbados, which, which is very flat, where the, the plantations fully occupied all the lands. So there wasn't much of such marginal lands to, for, the, for the slaves to cultivate. Then they imposed new and high property taxes, including land taxes. So they made, they made it much more difficult for the slaves to own land 
and to buy land, thereby forcing the, the, the former slaves to continue working for the um, sugar plantations. They license, they impose fees on, on horses and, and other means of transportation, and they set crown lands at artificially high prices and increased the minimum selling acreage size at which you could buy crown lands. They taxed, they taxed some of the produce that the slaves produced, they taxed those produce, like ground provisions, charcoal, cocoa, and wood, while exempting sugar, rum, and other byproducts that the plantations um, were cultivating. All this was to force the former slaves to continue working on the plantations at the wages the plantation owners wanted to pay. So clearly, there was emancipation, but it was like it was slavery by a different name. Under those conditions, the former slaves were living under dire economic conditions. Wage, unlivable wages, chronic unemployment, limited access to acquire land and other resources, and also because the sugar industry was in sharp decline. So, the former slaves, yes, they were emancipated, but, they left, but, but their living conditions had not improved much. Wasn't, any, wasn't much better than, than how they lived under slavery. So you could well imagine there were revolts. In 1949, there was the former slaves revolt, revolted against the, tax, the, the taxes that the authorities were imposing. The, the revolt ended when um, the authorities put to death eight of the leaders. So eight, eight, of, eight workers were committed to death um, as, a, um, as punishment for leading the tax revolt. And then in 1907, there was a Colcarius sugar strike which ended with police shooting, killing four workers and injuring over 20, 20 workers. In that period, the only way out for the, the only solution, the, one of the few ways the former slaves could improve themselves was to, was to migrate, to emigrate. So a lot of Caribbean people, a lot of West Indians, a lot of St. Lucians went and worked in the Panama Canal. They went to the gold mines of Guyana and Suriname, the plantations of Costa Rica and Guatemala, Honduras, sugar plantations of Cuba, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and also to the United States. So much so that in the 10 year period between 1901 and 19, 1911, about 8,217 St. Lucians migrated, which represented about 16% of the population. This was how serious, how critical, how much suffering people were undergoing, even though they were emancipated. Then came the 1930s. On top of the already unlivable conditions, sugar prices plummeted even further. And then we had the Great Depression that is in the period of the 1930s, where the whole world was ravaged by the Great Depression. So things get, got so critical in the West Indies that there was spontaneous labor uprisings. So much so that um, uh, 
the authorities killed 46 labor protesters. That's in the 1930s. Up over 400 were injured and thousands of people were arrested. British warships and police rifle squads were silent features of the regional landscape. St. Lucia, no one got killed in St. Lucia during that period, but St. Lucia too had its share of strikes. In 1935, the St. Lucia coal carriers went on strike. And in 1937, there were island-wide St. Lucia, there were island-wide sugar strikes. What, one good thing came out of this labor uprising. It forced the UK to take, to take note. And they did take action. They strengthened labor laws and trade union laws. They, allowed, they legalized the formation of trade unions. So consequently, throughout the region, after the 1930s um, um, strikes, revolts, uprisings, um, just, in, in just about all the islands, um, labor unions were formed. In St. Lucia, the first, in St. Lucia, the first union to establish in St. Lucia came in 1939, the St. Lucia Workers Cooperative Union, and it was registered in 1940. George Charles, at the time, um, at the time the union was being um, formed, in 1945, George Charles was working as a timekeeper on the, there was a VG airport extension um, construction going on, and George Charles was working there as a timekeeper. Time he, he, he got very frustrated that, to, to watch and see that time and again, workers trying to workers um, trying to secure better working conditions and better wages, but failing to do so. So out of great frustration, George Charles joined the St. Lucia Workers' Cooperative Union in 1945. And under the leadership of George Charles, a lot of great things, good things started happening in terms of improvements in the living conditions of St. Lucians. One of the first things George, one of the first things George, George Charles accomplished was to, la to launch the Castries Bakery Workers' Strike in 1947, which was the first strike, first ever union strike in the country. George Charles su successfully negotiated for better, pay better wages and working conditions for factory workers and the Castries bakery workers, he, he secured better compensation packages for um, the Castries city workers, town council workers, and he was, he, he was successful in securing higher wages and better working conditions for workers working on um, in the rebuilding of Castries after the 1948 fire. Okay, so after, 1930, after the 1930s, 1930, the 1930s was really a watershed, a watershed, watershed period. It forced England to react, to take note, and it, it forced England to start moving towards the freedom we defined. It forced England to start moving towards um, allowing its colonies that kind of freedom. So in 1950, England granted St. Lucia universal suffrage. This meant 
that for the first time in St. Lucia's history, the masses of the people, the regular people, had, had a vote and, and had a say in government, at least in selecting their representatives. Before, before, before 1950, to, to participate in the little politics that existed in, in the colony, you had to be able to read and write, and you had to have, you had to have substantial income and wealth. So before then, the masses had no say in how their, their country was governed. And this is long after, so long after emancipation, the masses still didn't have any say in how their country was governed. So in terms of freedom, they were emancipated, but based on how we have defined freedom, you could say they had very little freedom because So, with, with, with um, universal suffrage, the St. Lucia Workers' Cooperative Union metamorphosed into a political party, the St. Lucia Labour Party. And with George Charles in the leadership of that party. So, the first general elections after universal suffrage took place in 1951. And in that election, SLP ended with five of eight electoral seats. So for the first time in history, the masses had a voice in government. The ma masses had their own representatives in government. So, so after the 1951 gen um, general elections, the country took a step deeper into freedom. Nine years after, in 1960, nine years after universal suffrage, and after, and after two more SLP electoral victories, and with additional constitutional changes and a ministerial system of government, George Charles became the country's first chief minister and thus headed the first government, government of the people and from the people. The, the first government of and for the masses of St. Lucians. So again, so we have moved the freedom pendulum a bit further out. Now, the people's very own representative, representative is now heading, heading the government. So let us just summarize how George Charles pushed outward the freedom pendulum and what was some of his major accomplishments. Well, George, George Charles started the process of claiming the islands for the majority of its people and of dismantling its, cla its class structure. One of the things he did when he, f when he joined the union was to do away with the purpose section of the um, shock bay cemetery, where there was a purpose. So um, poorer people could only be buried in a certain section. Um, so by getting rid of, of that concept, that, that policy, that you could say that was the beginning of breaking down class barriers in St. Lucia. I would say that George Charles laid the political foundation of the country and established the industrial relations upon which the nation was built. My mentor and writing coach, um, Alan Wick, said that before George Charles, there wasn't a St. Lucian people. What was there then? Well, we were just masses of people working on the sugar plantations working to further the best, mostly for the best interest of the plantocracy and the UK and the crown. We, we were like subjects of um, uh, Britain, but we could not speak of a St. Lucian people. So the notion of a St. Lucian people 
came about, George Charles started that process, according to Alan Wicks. But George Charles, to me, didn't envision dismantling of, or overthrowing the colonial system. That's just an opinion. Rather, he, he aimed to work within the system to improve the lot of his people. So I don't think George Charles, his main aim or intent was to totally dismantle the colonial system, dismantle the structure. I don't think George Charles was speaking in terms of revolution. I think he was speaking in terms of better working conditions for his people, um, you know, um, in, in, uh, better wages, improving their welfare, uh, and so forth. Um, now, I'm, I'm presenting this lecture, <laughs> but uh, as I keep saying, there are people who, who are much better positioned <laughs> to, to speak on those issues. They have more intimate knowledge of what transpired and, and so forth. Um, but since I'm a writer, this is part of my um, subject matter. So as Dr. Hiller said, um, <laughs> I'm putting this out there, um, partly an opinion, and then um, I'm, I'll be happy to hear what you think. So that's George Charles. John Compton came, joined the political foray in 1950. He came from England with, I think, degrees in economic and law. And if you read George Charles's memoir, this period was a, was a very exciting period. In this period, here you had the people who were under the yoke of the plantocracy, um, the, the island being administered by administrators appointed um, by the British Crown. And then you have universal suffrage, you have political parties of the people. Um, it was a very exciting period. I mean, people like George Charles and his um, comrades were pushing for workers' rights, um, getting into the face confronting the plantocracy uh, and so forth. So Compton joined, joined the, the politics in that, whole, in that kind of atmosphere. And of course, he coming from the UK, um, where he, he would have been exposed to a lot of discussions. I mean, by then, a lot of countries in the, Afri in the continent had gained their independence. Um, uh, did Castro already have his revolution in 52 or, or, the, or after? Um, and then you had um, movements in the US um, and so forth. And then you had um, uh, the Sharpeville riots in um, South Africa where I think a bunch of people were killed um, when they um, were, um, well, marching. And also, Odlum was in the UK when, in that period when they had um, race riots, um, race conflict um, in the UK. So, come, so Odlum entered the picture um, from that kind of world um, um, uh, atmosphere. And he came with a certain kind of stance. There was um, he bought into black, the Black Power movement. He patterned himself. I guess he bought into socialism and communism. He, um, uh, he bought, he, 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 he patterned himself after revolutionaries like Fidel Castro and so forth. So this was Odlum's mind frame when he came back from England. Oh. <laughs> um, well, am I saying Odlum? I, I think I, I think I have mixed I, I have mixed the two narrat narratives, so I mean to stay with Compton. Anyway, so Compton joined the fray. Um, George Charles and, and his comrades were very happy to have him, but soon there were problems. 
in the 1954 general elections, George Charles wanted his father to, re to run for the Miku Denry seat. Oh, Compton said no, his, Compton wanted to run the seat himself. So Compton left the Labour Party and ran as an independent. He won his seat, but he was out of the party, out of the government. So according to George Charles, he took to writing a column in the trade union newspaper. I think his um, pen name was um, Sp Jack, um, Jack Spaniard, something like that, where he was confronting the plantocracy and seeking to supplant the plantocracy. But then came the 1957 sh sugar workers strike. It was almost an island-wide strike. And Compton as representative of the Denry area, went to the Denry Sugar Factory to have a chat with Dennis Bernard to confront B Dennis Bernard about better wages and working conditions for sugar workers. Legend has it that um, when he confronted B Dennis Bernard, Dennis Bernard pulled out his gun, and uh, apparently Odlum also pulled out a gun. Compton also pull out his gun, so there was a stalemate. But that stalemate made Compton a hero. So Compton came out as a hero. It was like Compton had entered into the inner cave of the enemy of the people, the enemy that enslaved the people, and came out with, um, with the elixir of empowerment and so forth. So Compton, so Compton was viewed as, as a hero, and Odlo, um, George Charles and his comrades were very happy to, to welcome him back into this SLP fold. But, um, but in the 1961, but came the 1961 general elections. By then, we had a um, ministerial system of government. So whoever, and as you know, SLP won that election. George Charles became chief minister. Uh, according to George Charles, Compton was too much in a hurry. He, could, he couldn't wait his turn. He wanted to be chief minister. So because Compton didn't, wasn't made chief minister, according to George Charles, Compton quit the St. Richard Labour Party and established the National Labour Movement Party. And in the 1964 elections, um, Compton teamed up with the People's Progressive Party, which was like a middle class, upper middle class party, a more conservative party than the SLP, to form the UWP. So Odlum contested the 1964 general elections on the, UW, the, UW, the UWP banner, and UWP was a merger of the National Labour Movement Party and the People's Progressive Party. UWP won that general elections, so Compton became chief minister. And in 1967, England introduced further constitutional changes. St. Lucia attained statehood in 1967. So again, the freedom pendulum was pushed further because now with statehood, St. Lucia was now responsible for its own internal affairs, whereas England remained responsible for external affairs. And Compton became the first and only premier of St. Lucia. And then in 1979, Compton at St. Lucia attained independence under John Compton. So John Compton became the first prime minister of St. Lucia. And to date, Compton is the longest serving head of government and the longest serving prime minister St. Lucia has had. What were Compton's, some of his major accomplishments? Slide um, 23. Well, I think we are probably quite familiar with some of Compton's accomplishments. Um, he oversaw 
the transformation of the country from a sugar, sugar plantocracy that spoke of economic, and ex, which was really an extractive economic institution that spoke of slavery, to a democratizing banana industry that set off a social and, and political and economic revolution. That's my opinion. <laughs> Then to a broad-based agricultural manufacturing and tourism economy, making it the OECS country with the largest economy and most diversified industry. I think the, 19, I think the 1957 sugar strike was in, instrumental in breaking the back of the plantocracy and maybe colonial rule. And I think it did a lot to the psyche of our people. And according to social historian, Jolene Hampson, the author of A History of St. Lucia, the first and only attempt at a comprehensive history book on St. Lucia, according to our esteemed um, social historian, Viewford has his very own social historian, Dr. Jolene Hampson. She said, um, Compton transformed poor, downtrodden, proletarian sugar workers into a middle class of prosperous farmers, of prosperous farming entrepreneurs. Finally, I would say Compton laid down the economic and infrastructural foundation of the country that enabled its development to take off. Okay, well, I've said enough nice things about Compton. <laughs> Let us see what um, Dr. Tennyson Joseph has to say about Compton in terms of freedom. So in terms of freedom, we can say there was a lot of economic empowerment on the Compton because the country developed people's standard of living, um, you know, rise up. Of course, it was a lot thanks to, to bananas, but it happened under his reign. So to the extent that economic development took place, people had um, greater access to, res to resources, people, education, and so forth. So to that extent, you could say um, the Compton push out the freedom pendulum. But according to um, Dr. Tennyson Joseph, Compton may have started as a radical, a communist, and so forth, um, intent and on revolutionary revolutionizing the system, supplanting the plantocracy and getting rid of um, colonialism. But when he got in power, Compton became conservative. And that is not surprising because I think when Compton um, took the reign of government, he realized that the white minority, the remnants of the plantocracy they were still around, but working behind the scenes, and they control a disproportionate amount of the wealth. So you could not really successfully manage the economy, run the country, without these people's um, uh, support. I also think Compton might have been radical, but, it, but when he merged with the P P People's Progressive Party, he merged with people that were more conservative than him. So I think that merger also had a bearing on Compton becoming more conservative. So, so according to Dr. Joseph, of course, there, there, was also, there is also the political reality of operating in the backyard of the US. The US can, can um, if the US is against you, I mean, the US can make life very difficult for your country. So Compton was quite aware of all, all of those realities. And so he gave sway to US political hegemony. And he subord, he so, subordinated domestic requirements to the, to the demands of domestic and foreign capital. So in other words, Compton compromised. Um, he gave, he prioritized the demands of international capital, domestic capital ahead, maybe ahead of the, the requirements of his people. That's according to Dr. Tennyson Joseph. 
So, so, well, let's look at that. Let's, so, on, on, on what is Dr. Joseph basing these, um, 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 that critic? Well, he said, um, Compton gave a lot of investment guarantee, gave investment guarantee, uh, offered protection against expropriation. Um, he, 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 he guaranteed the um, foreign um, business entities that um, he, he, that the, that they they could freely um, send their um, profits overseas. He placed he, no restrictions on sending profits overseas. Um, he gave generous investment incentives, exemption from income taxes, custom duties, and relief from double taxation. All this was given sway to foreign capital, of course, to encourage foreign capital to enter the country. But by so doing, um, sometimes it's at the expense of the country because now you're collecting less income tax and so forth. Dr. Joseph also said Compton restrained wages to render the island more conducive to foreign investments. So it seems like there was a definite policy to, keep, to dampen wages so, so that foreign entities can be encouraged to come to St. Lucia to take advantage of the low wages. And he established low-cost, cheap labor, duty-free manufacturing enclaves. <laughs> so for all these reasons, so these are some of the ways Dr. Joseph said that Compton characterized um, international and domestic capital ahead of the, the, the needs and requirements of St. Lucians. Of course, the rationale being that from Compton's perspective was that the country was so poor that um, people were unemployed, high unemployment, that he had to do all what he can do to bring in foreign capital and so forth. But that was at the expense of low wages and some St. Lucians will say almost unlivable wages. So to the extent this is true, then Compton push in that aspect, Compton, under Compton, the, 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 pen, the freedom pendulum got pushed inwards. Because remember how we define freedom. Um, so if Compton was allowing external entities, foreign capital and so on, to constrain how he go about helping his people, then to that extent, um, Compton was given up state freedom. So then we, we enter, then comes George Odlum. And I had already given a little intro on George Odlum. <laughs> so I think I, I'll go straight into um, so I'll go straight to slide 29. According to Dr. Tennyson Joseph, um, Judge, Or Judge, Judge Odlum reoriented the economy towards serving the needs of the population. He was talking about significantly increasing the share of local ownership of the island's productive assets. He wanted St. Lucians to own a larger share of the, the wealth and resources of the country. And he's, he was pushing that kind of stance in his rhetoric and so on. Um, he was encouraging and promoting black entrepreneurship and investment. He was advocating for land reform and other forms of wealth redistribution. And Compton wasn't satisfied operating within the present political structure. Compton, 
um, Adlam wanted to revolutionize the system. He wanted to change the whole structure, get away from the whole Westminster style of government. So, so Compton, Adlam wanted total freedom, not just political, not just economic, but he wanted psychological freedom, spiritual freedom. So he was advocating for a single party state and a government of national unity. Adlam also wanted to get out away from on the US political hegemony. So he was cultivating close ties with pariah um, governments like Grenada, Cuba, Libya, pariah in terms of the US attitude. Um, he was talking about prohibiting the establishment of any foreign military base on the island. And I think when he was spelling that out, he was thinking specifically in terms of the US. He, he was intent on supporting third world and nationalist movements around the world. He even wanted to establish a regional defense force ostensibly for combating external hostilities. <laughs> um, uh, In, in, in Odlum's brief stay in government, there were un, unprecedented interve interventions in the economy. There were unprecedented interventions in the economy geared toward improving the social and economic plight of the masses. He promised to take from the privileged sector, that's a quote, he, I, I'm quoting, he promised to take from the privileged sect of the society who have enlightened the load of the poor. He was seeking to impose substantial increases in corporate taxes. He was imposing income taxes on expatriate managerial salaries. His government purchased Halcyon Days Hotel, which was facing bankruptcy, bankruptcy ostensibly to protect hundreds of jobs. Odlum was pushing for a policy of localization that included shifting emphasis away from large foreign-owned hotels to small and medium-sized lo locally-owned guest houses and hotels. He established the National Commercial Bank to counteract foreign banks' domination of the banking system. And after Hurricane Allen, he imposed price controls on building materials and basic foods as a, res as a response to the havoc of the hurricane. So with, with all of those policies, goals, and emphasis, Odlum was truly um, fighting for the St. Lucian masses. Um, uh, uh, fighting, pushing for the ordinary solutions to gain a larger share of the economy. Um, he was um, resisting, opposing the domination of foreign capital. So, in brief, Odlum was really pushing for total kind of freedom. And I suspect the kind of freedom that the former slaves anticipated when they were being uh, emancipated. So Kenny, uh, Dr. Kenny Anthony entered the picture in 1997. Before then, he was a legal counsel at CARICOM. When Dr. Kenny entered the picture, a red carpet was rolled for him. Um, in Viewfort, on his way to, to the inauguration of his um, candidacy, Viewfort candidacy, like Christ entering Jerusalem, he rode on, on horses um, into to Viewfort. Um, but there is the interesting thing. Um, people say Adlam was a communist, a socialist, but I think from my reading, Dr. Anthony was, 
he was the real Marxist communist. He used to, from what I'm told, indoctrinate students at um, secondary school in Marxism. But it's, it seems like Kenny Anthony Lint looked at the failure of Odlum because part of the reason Odlum says, and also Dr. Joseph says, part of the reason Odlum never became prime minister was because of his radical philosophy, his radical intent, and which was a threat to the US, US hegemony. It was a threat to foreign and domestic capital because no businesses liked, liked to hear talk of national, nationalizing redistribution and so forth. So it was because of Odlum's freedom stance that he never became um, prime minister. So I think Kenny Anthony learned that lesson very well. Um, so well that when Kenny Anthony got in power, Odlum jokes that Kenny Anthony put two deputy prime ministers between him and between him and Odlum to make sure that Odlum <laughs> didn't even get a cent of the top job. <laughs> Well, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> um, so I think Kenny Anthony took a this. I think there was a decision to move away from the notion of, from the radical rhetoric the, um, that Odlum had adopted, the rhetoric against the U.S. Um, to get on the U.S. hegemony and to distance himself from the US and the, the rhetoric of a single party state, the rhetoric of redistribution. So, com, so, so Odlum, Kenny Anthony learned that lesson. So Kenny Anthony, in terms of economics, he patted himself after Compton, meaning that he gave sway to domestic and international capital and he was happy and he stayed under the US and Western Europe political hegemony. Okay, what are the, what are, what are the ways in which um, Kenny Anthony gives way to um, capital, to neoliberalism? Well, as soon as Dr. Kenny Anthony came into power, he spoke about a shift from an agriculture to a tourism and services based economy. And as you know, agriculture was very much small. Um, it was St. Lucian's very much running agriculture, right? Um, small banana farmers and so on. But when you move to a tourism service industry, you are really talking about the big players, the people running the, those sectors are really foreign entities, all the banks, the big hotels uh, and so forth. So, so again, Moving from an agricultural based economy to a tourism and service based economy is like moving towards an economy that is more dominated by foreign entities. That's just an opinion. <laughs> uh, Kenny Anthony rebranded NDC to invest in Lucia with a focus on attracting FDI as opposed to domestic investment. In my mind, invest in Lucia is specifically designed to, to secure foreign investment. So before businesses would um, complain that they bring proposals to invest in Russia for development in Beaufort, but being it is domestic capital, domestic investment, um, um, invest in Russia is, is not very forthcoming because the, it's like the, these lands they really want to set aside these lands for foreign investment. After all, the mandate of invest in Lucia is, I think, that's another opinion. <laughs> I probably need to be better educated on that, <laughs> Dr. Hiller. But I think invest in Lucia mandate is foreign investment. So if your mandate, if you are an organization and your mandate is foreign investment, of course, you will be given priority to foreign investment as opposed to domestic capital domestic investment. Uh, 
Well, Kenny and Fanny Anthony established was sole St. Lucian sovereignty via CPI, um, the um, citizen by investment. That's really a seal of um, St. Lucian sovereignty. Um, Odlum would say, he, um, Dr. Joseph said, he de-emphasized race and class equity and domestic economic ownership and empowerment. The kind of thing Odlum was pushing, can he de-emphasize that? Um, according to Dr. Tennyson Joseph. And like Compton, he subordinated domestic needs to the demands of foreign and domestic capital and the imperatives of neoliberalism. So, t so, so to the extent that Kenny Anthony gave sway to neoliberalism, to foreign capital, is, is the extent we move away from freedom. Because this means you are more, you have become more constrained um, in you forming policies and programs designed to help your people. But, but remember, at heart, I, Kenny Anthony is a socialist. Um, at heart, one person said Kenny Anthony has a very soft heart. <laughs> um, so, so even though he gives way, like Compton, he gives way to, to U.S. hegemony and, capi and foreign capital, I think he did foster a kinder and gentler country. For example, I think under Kenny Anthony, we had a more equitable distribution of, of access to services and opportunities. Kenny Anthony um, had a very good relationship with trade unions, labor unions. I think under him, um, the labor laws were strengthened, and so workers had, ha, have got a, a much bigger voice in, in um, securing better working conditions. Um, I think under Kenny Anthony, there was greater access to sports, cultural, and education facilities. He established safety nets like the districts, like the distress support fa fund. Um, he supported, under him, the jazz festival expanded to the broad format um, that we saw this year. Um, and, and, and I think in his last term as prime minister, Kenny and Fanny Anthony implemented the most ambitious employment program I've, I think the, co the country has ever implemented. I mean, um, um, we, of course, Pierre is talking about the youth economy, but when I look at some of the initiatives that Dr. Anthony implemented, um, you could say that um, um, so far, Pierre, um, this current administration hasn't done as much for youth economy as Kenny Anthony did during his last term. That's just an opinion. Or because he had a very ambitious, and, and Kenny Anthony, he, well, we got universal secondary school education under Kenny Anthony. I think he professionalized the governance of the country. I think he moved away from the strongman, one-man show style of governing. So, so, so far, for implementing those kind of policies, to, to, I think Kenny Anthony pushed, in that re respect, he pushed the freedom pendulum because he gave, and he was very intent in the, the designing policies to cater for the most vulnerable of, of citizens and to improve their community food paths and so forth. Um, and, and I think pe people, St. Lucians got better access. Um, people were no longer punished. Whole communities were no longer punished for not voting for this party or that party, um, as was obta as obtained before Kenny Anthony came into power. So, so to me, in those kind of respects, Kenny Anthony pushed 
the freedom pendulum outwards. Big band? Yes, well, yeah, I, yeah, a whole bunch of them. <laughs> um, then came Chastney in 2016. Despite all the odds, despite being uh, a white man or almost white man, before Chastney, it was 60 years, almost 60 years, that um, remnants of the plantocracy were out of political power. I think 60 years. Um, so Chastney was thought of as being barely St. Lucian, I mean, culturally speaking, yet he beat all of those odds to become the prime minister. According to St. Lucian's, um, it's Saint Chastney was very anti-freedom, that's the perception. People complain that he denigrates St. Lucian's and robbed them of their St. Lucian-ness. So, so, he, so apparently, um, um, Chastney undermined, I guess, the feel-good aspect about being St. Lucian. I guess that's what people mean by he robbed them of their St. Lucianness. He was taught to serve the interests of rich friends, family, and foreigners at the expense of the populace. That's the perception. Um, so um, ordinary St. Lucians no longer had, had less access to the resources of the country. Um, he disregarded the country's sovereignty and cultural and natural patrimony. For example, um, he undermined um, the ability of national trust to do his job in safeguarding the country's um, natural patrimony. Um, Chastney defended some of the social and environmental programs. For example, discontinued RSL, cut the National Trust funding. He defended social safety nets, like the, he disbanded the People's Distress Fund. He turned, in my mind, the Jazz Festival into an elitist undertaking, where most of the events were taking place up north. He cheapened the country's sovereignty by relaxing CIP application and participation requirements. And he hand over key national assets to foreign entities with insufficient regard to social and environmental ramifications and what the country was getting in return. Um, so, come, so, so what I think about um, Chastney is that he bought wholesale into neoliberalism. He, he bought wholesale into laissez-faire economics, into um, unfettered markets. Um, he, well, th I think that's what he meant when he said he wanted to run the country as a business. Um, so based on, our, based on our definition of freedom and based on the anti-freedom um, consequences of neoliberalism. You could say Chastney pushed the freedom pendulum inwards, back further than, inwards further than I'm um, uh, past, lower than I'm, um, lower than Odlum, lower than Con Compton, and maybe even lower than George Charles. Um, if, we, if, we, if we agree with the perception, people's perception of um, 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 Chastney's um, reign. So, so then comes Philip J. Pierre to the 2021 general elections. In my mind, Labour didn't have a credible vision for the country. In my mind, Labour ran a campaign 
as a reaction to, to Shastri. Um, so, in other words, as, as I have written before, it was like vote SLP or suffer the Shastri train wreck. Um, so, to me, that was the stance of, um, of SLP. Um, so, in a so, in reaction to, um, to Shastni's reign, SLP came up with um, talk about providing greater support for some of the country's cultural events. And, um, and, and I'm giving um, Dr. Hile kudos <laughs> because I think right now we are, we are doing a very good job in presenting our cultural expressions. Um, I think that is part I think that is part of the intent I'm talking about. And um, to some extent this was a response to Shastni's reign, I think. Of course um, the current administration is in the process of replacing the Privy Council with the Caribbean Court of Justice. I think this is pushing freedom outwards because um, I think it's time we, where it's almost like we are saying the justice of the people who enslave us is better than our own justice. Um, so clearly um, replacing, um, working with the Caribbean Court of Justice is moving towards greater freedom. Um, Pierre has, is, implemented the youth economy, which is um, ensuring that young people get a larger stake, a larger share of the country's resources. Um, I, I talked about, um, I think the administration is expanding and enhancing the country's cultural enterprise. I think Dr. Hille, for example, in tourism, Dr. Hille have spoken about um, wanting St. Lucians to get a larger slice of the tourism my, um, business. Um, Pierre quickly reinstate the People's Distress Fund that Shastney had disbanded, reinstate the National Trust's subvention, which allowed the National Trust to reopen the Derrick Walcott um, um, house. And, and as I mentioned before, um, Pierre returned St. Lucia Jazz the St. Lucia Jazz and Arts Festival to its more all-inclusive, -inclus more democratic format. So really, um, with Pierre's administration, the, the, I think in terms of stance, rhetoric, and some of the initiatives they are embarking on, it's, it's really about pushing the freedom pendulum outwards. But, but there is the interesting thing. All the things, um, uh, it took, it took um, Shastney, who many, barely, culturally speaking, is barely St. Lucian. It took Shastney, a uh, political novice that people said didn't have the master to be prime minister. It took his reign to push the SLP party back into the fold of, of Odlum because most of the things um, SLP is pushing now, the rhetoric and so on, it sounds very much like the kind of um, stances um, Odlum was taking. So really it took Sh Shastney, the reign of Shastney for, Sh for Odlum to get some vindication because in reacting to, Sh to Shastney, um, SLP has moved closer towards um, the kind of things Odlum was advocating. And, and I would say in that, in that sense, um, the current administration has put, pushed the freedom pendulum further out than where Kenny left it, but maybe not as... Um, not as high as um, Odlum. <laughs> so <laughs> I have um, uh, 
presented a model um, um, with maybe you could consider the numbers a bit arbitrary. But what I'm saying is before, before emancipation, we had a negative index of 100 in terms of freedom. Emancipation, it brought us to zero. Under George F.L. Charles, we could say, it, pick a number, it went up to 40. We got um, representation, we got the vote, and we, we, f through the efforts of George Charles and his comrades, I think we got better working conditions, maybe greater access. John Compton, by virtue of moving the, the country's economy forward, and also um, his fight in, in, um, in his early career in fighting the plantocracy. So I, so I, and then the, we, we gained um, self-rule, full self-rule on the, on the Compton. So I would say he brought the index to 60, a bit, a bit higher than where George F.L. Charles left it. And if, and if, if we are to um, abide by Dr. Joseph's, Joseph, Joseph's analysis of, of um, Odlum, then we would say Odlum really pushed the Freedom Index way up, say um, to 90%. Then Kenny and then he came. Um, he, I think he, the index came down a little bit lower than where um, Odlum left it. And then Chastney came, and it seems like the index went qu quite a bit down, maybe even lower than where it was with George Charles. And then now, in reaction to Chastney, Philip J. Pierre government pushed it way up but maybe still not up to where George Odlum um, um, uh, left it. Yeah, so this is really my presentation. Thank you very much. That was not only a mouthful, that was filled with mouths <laughs> and people who really and truly have their hands in our freedom for so many years. Are we free? That's my question. Are we free? When are we going to be free if we are not free? What makes us free? Who's going to make us free? Ourselves? Somebody else? We have to think about it. And let's see how we can free view forth so that the rest of uh, St. Lucia can truly be free, if that is possible at all. Well, we have to try, try somewhere, somehow, to do something. And we can start with what Dr. Anderson has proposed. And I believe there is something that could come out of it. Let's be positive. Let's be proactive. Let's do what we can. Right, Dr. Hilaire? <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Um, um, what's his name? Can you imagine? Cassie Elias, I cannot remember his name. Thank you for being there. I forgot to mention you earlier. Thank you very much. So now I believe we have, um, I'm sure uh, Jolene Hampson, Dr. Jolene Hampson, would have uh, many questions for Dr. Reynolds, right? Don't you think? Yes? So you can come up here. But before we get to the question and answer segment, we would like to welcome uh, none other than Dr. Jolene Hampson. She's considered to be an adopted view fortune, but an historian. She did her PhD uh, dissertation on a social history of Viewfort, so she's well, well attuned or in tune with Viewfort, and she is the author of three books on St. Lucia, including a history of St. Lucia, as Dr. Reynolds mentioned earlier, which is perhaps the first and only attempt at a comprehensive documentation of St. Lucia's history. Without further ado, thank you very much. Dr. Emerson, thank you. 
Good night, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Hiller. Nice to have you here. Very nice to see. It's always nice to see big politicians drive down to Viewfort and take the time. It's very much appreciated in the South, more, I think, even than maybe you might realize. So thank you for being here. Anderson, uh, before I, I, I launch into this, is not easy, eh? a big, brave um, lecture like that, that covers so many angles. Sorry, I'm tall. Um, before I get to you, I also want to say that I'm so pleased to have Cordelia here today. Cordelia stood at the very, very, very start of my career in Viewfort back in September 1994 after the tropical storm debut, the first flight that landed after they got the mud off the runway. And I stayed at St. Martin's guest house and who lived there but Cordelia. And she's the very first person who turned my nose, because you were doing A-levels at the time, I think, uh, told me to go and check Gregor, um, Gregor Williams. Um, I kind of pointed my nose to a few people around here. So I'm very pleased to see Cordelia here. I didn't even recognize it. That's how little we see of each other. Um, Anderson is braver. Huh? I mean, he's in an, he can be incredibly annoying. I can really disagree with him sometimes. We talk for hours on the phone and, you know, but he's brave. And he's particularly brave because as a historian, I take the safe route in a way. I, we, we, we look at the long lines. And when we wrote the History of St. Lucia book in 2012 with Robert Evo and Guy Ellis, Guy got to do everything after, well, it was supposed to be after the Second World War, but it was after 1967. I, I brought it up to 67. And I was very happy. All I had to do was edit his work because that's when it gets tricky. Um, when you get so close into current events, there is so much happening and there's so much disruption and distortion and little things that seem important at the time. When you 10, 20, 30, 40 years on, you start to see the long lines and a lot of that stuff just falls by the wayside. Even I have to admit in our own history book, there are things that we thought were important at the time that I would never even have considered putting in the book. Now, in light, for instance, of the Alan Chastney government that we've just had, that, that every time you look, you move 10 years on in time and you look back again, think your perception, your interpretation of history changes. And the closer you are to the events, the harder it is to see the long line. I want to draw a couple of long lines for you. Um, and then let's move into the question and answer session. I'm doing this off the top of my head. Without wanting to be pedantic, there are two little historical things I'm going to have to pick you up on. 1849, the, um, the land tax revolt. For true, eight people died during the revolt. But it's not because they were convicted by the judge after the revolt. Um, the people that were arrested and uh, went to trial were all convicted to um, time in prison with hard labor. But nobody was actually condemned to death for having been part of the, um, the riot. The people that died, died because, um, you know, rough policing, if you like. The second one is you mentioned in the 1961 election that John Compton uh, was, wanted to be chief minister, and that's why George Charles um, you know, told him he has to wait, he's too quick. It was actually um, Compton and Mason, they both had won their seats uh, and they were denied ministerial positions. They didn't demand to be chief minister, but they were, they were passed over for jobs as ministers and that really pissed them off. And that's why they started the national labor movement and eventually the UWP. So that's just two little corrections there. Um, what do I have to say about what Anderson said in terms of long lines? Um, first of all, we had 120 years of slavery in St. Lucia. We call it the 120 year war in the book. Slavery in St. Lucia, I'm not talking about the Caribbean or the Americas, that started way back when in the 1500s. In St. Lucia, first mention of slavery is in 1720. Abolition is in 1838, it's 120 years. It took us 120 years after abolition to break the power of the plantocracy. So as long as we had slavery, it took us the same amount of time again to break the power of, of the plantocracy. And that really is that scene that Anderson describes there of, of um, and again, it's slightly different, I believe, in the, in the other version of um, that confrontation. George Charles writes about it. He says, after all the workers of the Denry estates and factories had walked out, John Compton walked into the factory to speak to someone. He wasn't looking for Dennis Barnard, but Dennis Barnard was smarting from the humiliation of the workers' walkout. He arrived on the scene and he told Compton to get them out of his factory. 
And it was reported, as you said, that revol revolvers simultaneously appeared as if from nowhere, like cowboys menacing each other. And that incident marked the beginning of Compton's physical involvement in the strike. So 120 years of slavery, 120 years of continuing conditions that are very similar to slavery, right? Sugar. And it was really with the break from sugar and eventually the introduction of bananas that you see a, a, a radically different um, state of being in St. Lucia, where the plant, plantation economy, where you have a few people at the top using and abusing uh, masses of the workers and the people in order to extract as much wealth as possible for their own benefit, right? To a situation where you have bananas, where everybody who has access to a little bit of land, whether that's family land or per private land uh, or even squatted land, uh, can start to earn money with bananas every fortnight. So that radicalized, that was really a radical change eventually after the Second World War for St. Lucia. And everybody, I think, still understands the concept of banana money. Right? Banana money is where you go to the docks, you sell your bananas, you get your check, and you use that money how you want to use it. So yes, from an in internationally speaking, we're still a small country and we still have to bow to the, for the influence of the West and large economies, and Compton was a pragmatist. He had, you know, that, I'll come back to that in a minute. I want to pick you up on that, but yes, yes um, under, the, under the influence of the World Trade Organization, St. Lucia lost its preferential uh, access to the markets, which you can say is really where you could see uh, that freedom being curtailed by the outside Western world, because that was hypo hypocritical. America took St. Lucia and the other islands to the World Trade Organization. America doesn't grow one banana on American soil, but American multinationals have you know, a hand in banana um, companies in, 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 in Middle America and South America. Where was I? Yeah, Compton was pragmatic. So, okay, so we lost bananas, and we have the changeover to Kenny Anthony didn't have a choice. We had to move to something, so we went to tourism and services industry. Point I want to make, and we have the Minister for Tourism here, if I'm not mistaken, is that it's not because you have an agricultural economy or a tourism economy that one is of, of its own accord um, more a plantation economy or less of a plantation economy. In, in agriculture, you can have sugar that's, that was organized according to the principles of plantation e economics, whether that was slavery or the 220 years after slavery, that was very much an extractive uh, plantation economic model. When we got bananas, we're still doing agriculture, but now we have banana money. So we're still agricultural, but everybody, every farmer is now getting his money. So now you have an eco economy that is geared towards the best interest of the people of the country. The same thing goes for tourism, but that is not something that I hear any of us really speak about very much. Not even Kenny Anthony's government, neither the current government. I'm not hearing that discussion. I talk about it a lot, and I'm, you're here. I don't know if you want to hear it or not, but in my view, whether, when you have a tourism-based economy, you still have to think about how does that articulate? How do you articulate that, that economic system with your people? You know, everybody thinks, tourism industry, okay, that's hotel, hotel, hotel. Where are the hotels? We need a hotel. In Viewfort, and I'm going to bring this right down to Viewfort. In Viewfort, we've had a, a tourism for decades with the medical schools. Never mind Halcyon, Club Med, or Coconut Bay, which is the first thing everybody always thinks about. When you think of residential tourism and the influence that the, the medical schools have had in Viewfort over the decades, that is banana money. That was banana money. We're moving away from it. We haven't given it the attention that it deserves, but that was banana money. Everybody with a little apartment in Black Bay and Cedar Heights and St. Jude's Highway, that was banana money, all right? But when we think of Coconut Bay, Coconut Bay is, is Jamaican foreign owned. You know, you book that overseas, the money goes back to Jamaica. That is very much, very much along the lines of a Sandals, for instance, where you have one, one, one business owning one, two, three, four, five, all-inclusive resorts. I think at one time, St. Lucia had the highest rate of all-inclusive rooms of any island in the Caribbean. That, that's the plantation style, um, plantation economic style of having tourism. We need to think about that. If you go to Labry, Labry is full of white people in the tourist season. Where's the hotel? Where's the hotel? They don't have a resort. And God forbid that Labry not get a resort, in my opinion. That's Airbnb money, 
right? And then there we have boutique hotels. That's somewhere in the middle. These are people that are invested in your island who own that property. But we need to start thinking about how do we articulate our socio-economic development with the people? Is the, is the, the, the what we bring in, because um, you talk about Compton and his industrialization by invitation, and you're right, a lot of low, uh, low wage jobs, you know, the factories, it's jobs, but you know, and you can say the same thing about the call centers now, but at least they provide some employment. So this brings me back to the point I was going to talk about, about radicalism and pragmatism. You confuse Otlum and Compton. That is not really that surprising. That's not that surprising. When you go through all these guys that you have there, really and truly, the only, I want to say not, I don't want to say abomination, aberration in there is Chastney. These other guys, I know we have party politics and I know we're fighting red against yellow, but these guys, all the other ones, that is one continuous line. I am not kidding. When I was telling people in the last election, if John Compton was a young St. Lucian back in, when was the last election, 2021? He would have voted for Pierre. Of course, he wouldn't even have had to think about that. The radical roots of George Charles, John Compton, Odlum, Dr. Anthony, and Pierre, they, there's, that's one line. That is one continuous line of guys who care about the country, about the people of St. Lucia, and how can you best provide an economy that serves the interest of the people of, of St. Lucia. All of these guys are moving away from plantation eco economics. They're all faced with a situation where they need to be pragmatic as well. The only one who didn't care about that, because he never came to be prime minister, was George Otlum, which is why he can get a 90, because he was never confronted with the reality of having to be prime minister. If he had ever had to be prime minister, he would have been right down there in the mid-40s, just like the other guys. Yeah? The only really aberration in that line of men that you have there, and you've said enough about it, and I'm going to keep my big mouth shut, is the second one from the right there. Yeah? And one last thing, you touched on it in West St. Lucia. I just want to bring it back to Viewfort for a moment. You cannot understand the history of Viewfort if you do not look at access to land. You know, if you want to talk about freedom and self-realization, if you like, you need to talk about access to the means of production. You have access to labor, but do you have access to capital, credit, and do you have access to land? Now, that was a struggle from the time of abolition. People tried to get access to land, and a peasantry did eventually develop, but it's against um, enormous odds. But in Vieuxfort, because we have so much flat land, and you, you put it best, the land is too good for the people of Vieuxfort. And again, that is something that I don't think even this current government has really reflected on, from what I can see. And that is the role that Invest in Lucia has been granted, same point you make. Invest in Lucia fits right in that same line of the Duboulets who used to own the sugar factory, plant slavery first, then the sugar factory, then you get the Barbados settlement scheme where they bring Bajans down to Vieuxfort and give them five acres of land while the Vieuxfortians are considered wage laborers and people unsuitable to being landowners themselves. Then you get the Second World War with the American base here. And then after the Second World War, they try a little land settlement schema. Well, that doesn't work. The infrastructure that was left behind by the Americans got taken up and transported to Castries after the 1948 fire. And all those three, four, eight thousand acres of land that we have here were given to be looked after by NDC and now Invest in Lucia, waiting for the foreign investor. And meanwhile, people live in Bruceville and the Mang and the Bacadere on land that belongs to the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, or the government, Invest in Lucia. And no, you can't have that. We have three generations, maybe we have four generations by now, of people who are born and raised on that little piece of land in, in Bruceville. Shantytown, the Mang, but particularly in Bruceville. Um, and they're just squatters, and they're looked upon as squatters. They are, you know, I mean, you, yes, you marginally improve conditions by putting in, you know, you have to, you have to look after your people. You put in water and concrete paths, and we're no longer quite in the mud that we were in the 1980s. But that structural, radical, that all these guys agree on, except for the one, the second one from the right. Um, if to, to break that, you need to start giving people access to land. And that really needs to be questioned. And it's not just a matter of DSH that just brought it to such a ridiculous extent that you cannot but 
have to, number one, campaign on the back of that, and number two, it's, you're right, it's really brought that to, to into, because into, it's been so exaggerated, you know, you now need to speak about land ownership. But that is something that's going to need to be addressed, I think. If we ever want to try and change something for Viewfort, land ownership, you cannot deny that. I think I've said enough. I really love, can't wait to hear your questions. And Anderson, I guess you'll come back up here to, re to reply to them. Yeah, any questions, um, remarks? Um, I know you must be tired by now. <laughs> Probably kept you, kept you here too long. Oh, um, Pastor um, Emmanuel. Yeah, but he was a, a, a non-factor. He was just a placeholder. Um, I mean, he resided over a dysfunctional government. So, you, so there, is, there is not much analysis to be made in terms of um, Stevenson King. I mean, yeah, I mean, he, he wasn't empowered to do different. I mean, he, he was barely in charge of his government. Every minister, including uh, even the Taiwanese ambassador, was like the prime minister of Russia. So, so, so I, I don't think I can bring him, bring him into the, this analysis. Um, yeah. Yes, um, Augustus. Uh, Yeah, no problem. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, Cordelia. When it comes to numbers, I, 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 <laughs> uh, I love numbers, but I think there is a beauty in numbers because they speak to exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I guess it does. So I, I was just wondering whether you could um, deconstruct the numbers. Uh, okay. Well, actually, <laughs> it's quite arbitrary, um, and you can think of the numbers there more, not so much the magnitude, but more the rank, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, more, more, uh, but when you add numbers, you capture more att attention, you know, um, but it is more to help tell the story, but, but of course it is, uh, it is quite, um, as any statistician, I mean, it is not a rigorous, it, has, it is not a rigorous exercise at all. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I won't even, um, and it's subjective to, um, for example, I, I was on DBS to, to uh, on the, to, interviewed about the lecture and I um, shared the, the video clip and one sent a few fortune living overseas tell me um, uh, St. Lucia um, is very fortunate that Odlom didn't become prime minister. He himself was a foot soldier that were being trained to, on the Odlom to overtake the um, uh, Compton government. So, um, and so if, if Odlom had his way, we would have been a communist country 
St. Lucia would have been very poor and so on. So in terms of, of my freedom um, index, I thought, well, if this is true, if um, Odlomo is going to take the country by force, impose communism, and it seems like it is the world consensus now that communist countries are, regimes are oppressive. If, if, if that is so, then to the extent that Odlum became prime minister and we became a communist state, maybe to our, to, it's to the, to the extent that we lose some of our personal freedom because it seems the consensus is um, uh, communist countries tend to be re repressive in terms of personal freedom. Um, I, I don't know if, 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 if my feedback um, coincides with your question. <laughs> but but I am, I'm explaining to say it's a, this is really arbitrary and somebody doing the same analysis and including um, some of the things that doesn't appear, that doesn't get spoken too much about, might well um, say odd lomos anti-freedom. <laughs> um, well, Dongs at the back, and then um, Mr. Dongs. Yeah. Uh, it came across to me that what was presented on the issue of those names were presented as facts. Except in one case, the case of Alan Chatelain, you insisted on saying these were perceptions. <laughs> now, if that is correct, how many of this took about that disposition about uh, making that kind of presentation? So you, you are concerned about, um, so, you, mean, so you, you are saying in your mind what I presented wasn't about um, Shastri, it is just perception, is the reality. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you have a good point, but, but, but pa, pa, it's partly a lot of the things that are said of um, Shastney isn't very concrete, and the evidence, not as much evidence to support it. For example, putting, putting, putting foreigners first, um, um, con giving the country to his rich friends. These are... I mean, can you verify that? I mean, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it's not percept. Oh, well, and these are not these were actual things, right? Because, yeah. All right, I, I get your point. And so, when 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 I'm revising, I'll take <laughs> I'll take note. Um, yes, um, red t-shirt. Um, you've been, but you can come afterwards. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, we, um, the, the, the first part, I'm not sure that's what we were saying. Um, he didn't get high marks because he became, uh, he didn't become prime minister. But what, what I think Dr. Hamson is saying is 
or somebody else said, um, when, if he had become prime minister, then he would have been confronted with the compromises that must be made when you run in a country. So it was all fair and well, he wasn't prime minister, he could be radical because, yeah, I think that was the point. What was your second um, question? Well, it's not a matter of experience. It's, it's, um, oh, I should have, I, I, it slipped me. I, well, I did, um, it's more his philosophy, his um, political economic philosophy. He bought, I think he bought wholeheartedly into the notion of laissez-faire economics, kind of like Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan kind of economics, um, trickle-down um, economics, um, uh, um, uh, free enterprise, reduce restrictions, um, uh, environmental restrictions, um, develop without giving full regard to the environment and how you are impacting people's, um, the society, dis quite willing to dislocate people without consultation. It is more uh, a more gang-ho gang -ho kind of um, uh, um, uh, conservative um, economic pol policy. It is, so it is not, well, of course, um, people talk about his racist and so on, but after listening to him, I, although I don't see his racist, or I, I don't think that's, that has anything to do with his, um, I think what it has to do with, he has bought wholeheartedly into that kind of laissez-faire economics. And also, I think, Maybe there is a little bit of disdain in that. He thinks what is, what is done overseas and how people do it overseas is superior to how we do it here. And maybe people from overseas, um, I don't know, I am, it, are intrinsically better than us or, or well, no, I, I, I will take, um, so, but I will take that because I'm getting into on short, on short territory there. Um, what I should say instead is that he cannot believe he can um, adopt things he sees overseas and implement it wholesale in St. Lucia without making the proper modifications, without thinking it through to what extent it is applicable to St. Lucia. Because what may work very well in, in other places may not work as well here in St. Lucia because of our size, our culture, our history. All of, all of that mainly has to be taken into consideration when we think in, in terms of development. <laughs> well, for after slavery, yeah. <laughs> well, um, well, it's, it's both, I mean, um, but, but there is a thing, um, imagine you own slaves, you see them as inferior, barely human, they are your capital, and all of a sudden they are free, they want to tell you they are working for that wage, um, they are working for you when you want them to work, then they want to be voting, they want to be um, joining your social clubs. They want to be mixing with you. And, and these were your slaves. These were inferior people. Um, uh, you perceive to be inferior and so forth and so on. Um, I forget your, your, the second part. What was your second part? Oh yeah, okay. Well, of course, um, but there is a thing, right? We, 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 don't, we cannot do things or govern in abstract. Even our current leaders, what, what they found in place, you know, this whole country was designed, the whole government, the whole institution was designed to extract, to extract um, from, from, from St. Lucia um, and to serve as, and part of the extraction was for St. Lucia to serve in terms of 
strategic um, geographic st strategic and so forth um, in terms of England's um, uh, um, uh, imperialistic intent. And so this whole country, the whole um, government was not, wasn't designed for, to, to forward our best interests. It was designed to serve the plantocracy and the crown and to ex and that's why I, um, so let me not make it too long but so when our own people get in power <laughs> what is the example they have in front of them the example they have in front of them is the plantocracy the colonial government this is a, it is from this is how they learn how to govern but these people were governing in a very extractive faction so to, so to some extent, this tendency may be lingering right into our um, co current government and not any party per se, but in times, I'm talking about the, uh, the mindset of my mindset. I'm not excluded from that, you know. I'm talking about our mindset um, is still being informed by the legacies of slavery, the legacies of colonialism. And to what extent our, our leaders feel that the country is there not to serve the people, but to um, serve their own interests. Because why? Because that's what it was before. I mean, so that's the pattern we, we, we learn from. So to what extent that persists to the present? Well, that's an empirical question that requires some research. Um, I think we are... I think we should be calling it a, a day, but um, I'll take two, two more questions. Uh, <laughs> you have a question? Okay. Um, so I, I think, um, uh, uh, Mr. Colimo, you have been putting your hands up so, so long. Yeah. So I think there is a lot of deprivation of personal freedom. Now, when you talk about poverty, poverty is multidimensional. It's not just money or the one dollar nine five cents that the world, the um, international agencies deem as being poor. It's not just one dimensional. Sure. I, I understand you. Yeah, well, it, it, it definitely doesn't capture it does everything. And that's, that's the thing about models and theory. It's an abstraction. But 
in, imagine I have an hour to present this, so it has to be streamlined, and I have to focus on a, if I have to be broad like you, then we'll be here. <laughs> but, um, I understand, uh, yeah. But I think we have been here long enough. I can't take too many more. Um, Big Ben? Um, yes. Um, about this? Um, uh, um, uh, the, the stop us. It is you that need to stop us. Surprising that not one politician or leader, political leader, has ever fought for 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 reparation, reparation, because the section to serve. We have been from a fourteen battles of fought. Seven times British rule. Seven times. Yes. So what? So your question is on reparations. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so, so you are saying no political leader is really focusing on reparations. That's I've never heard any. Well, um, we have a reparation committee. That's um, I was I was on that committee um, a few years ago. So th there is um, and um, Dongo Wisely is um, is on that committee, a reparations committee. He's right there. So, so, but but I may agree with you. Uh, maybe. We can, maybe our government can, can be more supportive of it. But honestly, I'm not that gung-ho about reparations per se. Why? Because um, I'm not sure what England now say they're sorry about slavery. Sorry? No, no, listen. <laughs> I'm answering your question. And, and to give us some money. To me, that, that's, that's not... How, where I would like to fo prefer to focus in terms of reparation. I would prefer to focus on we repairing the damages what brought by, by slavery, right, the psychological it, damages. It, it, it is billions of dollars so, we put in this little corporate. Yeah. Both from the left and the So let, let, let um, uh, Ras, 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 um go ahead. I think this will be the final question. Um, yes, because we have gone to the limit If you read his memoir, it's, it's quite in. Maybe you can read his memoir. I have his memoir. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the other issue I want to raise up as it pertains to even freedom. Yeah. But the question is being asked are we free? What is, what is the emancipation and so on? Based on the <coughs> presentation, you know, as we have spoken to some of the leaders who then shifted the
That's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Now, that has continued up to today. Because what we have is that in, when we put independence, it was supposed to be a decolonizing process. What we have is that we move from colonialism to neo-colonialism. Neo neo-colonialism. Yes, right. So in terms of, of the freedom, the emancipation, and, and so on, you know, we, we still have a lot to be, there's still a lot to be desired. And even as the president asked about the reparation issue, yeah. since 2013, the CARICOM government agreed to entertain the reparations campaign. They set up the CARICOM reparation commission and then mandated all the islands to set up national reparation committees. Yeah. And up to a day like today, none of those committees have received not, not just the Central government. Other, other, all, other, all of them. I haven't received. Only re last year, Honorable Pierre made a statement in terms of the, uh, how we look at emancipation, which is welcome. We have fully appreciated that. But in terms of the reparation, because reparation is not just about asking for money. Mm -hmm. Reparation has the internal and external. Mm -hmm. External deals with the debt it has to be repaid. Yeah. But the internal, which is the self healing, is very the which we ourselves yeah. need to do for ourselves, yeah. among ourselves. Yeah. And that is where we find our leaders and we drop the ball. Yeah. They set up the, the reparations committee, but then with no support. Because education is very important in terms of yeah. reparation. Okay, I, I get the point. Um, These are still laughing up to now. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the. Um, I think I think that 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 should conclude us. Um, I, Depending on what we talk, we're, we're talking about. I think you, you, you said you wanted to make a closing comments. I, I wanted to make a point that was your question. Oh, go ahead. Um, this, this is the last, last, um, last question. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm very sorry. Um, so there were a couple of things that you said. For example, as you mentioned, there is no record of um, yes. before 
No time. <laughs> it is not a matter of time. Um, it's a matter of. <laughs> well, these are uh, thoughtful observations. <laughs> um, observations I need to give more thought to. I, I never thought of um, the part about um, the first part, you, the first point you made about if we had not um, gone the way of labor unions and political parties, our whole government structure might have been very different. We might well have been. I'm communist states. Um, yeah, so that's, I never, that's, that's the first time I've, in, I've encountered that. So I, I would need time to think more about it. Maybe do a little bit more re reading. But um, thank you very much. Um, I think um, we have kept you here long enough. Um, I would. Thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. Give him a big hand. I wouldn't say that he has risen the dead, but um, he, because of his ex, him exposing all those thoughts about those politicians, 
we have a lot of things on our plate and we have a lot of food for thought. So we really have a lot of work to do. At first to be able to know whether or not we are free and how are we going to be free and if ever we will be free. Okay? Because that question has been, from the time I was, I was in, um, I started um, uh, university level, I'm like, okay, they say we're free, so how come I can't choose my own course? How come they're telling me to do this? I wanted to be a writer from the get-go. They said, no, we don't have this here. So I said, well, I'm going somewhere else. And then that's what happened. Anyway, we are not free, okay? We're not free. Sometimes we can consider ourselves to be free depending on what's going on in our minds. And other times we know that if our children cannot get a job that they really want to do, then why, why would we, what's going to motivate them to want to work? What's going to motivate them to want to work if they can't do what their, their, um, their, 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 their self-conscious mind tell them to do? You know, we just have to direct them, guide them, give them the opportunities so that they will be able to move on. Okay? So at this point, I'm sorry I took a little more time. We would really like to thank um, Nintus for his um, serenading of the evening, in, um, especially in, in, in Creole. Um, uh, we also would like to, to thank Mr. Um, Mr. Dr. Ernest Hilaire for making sure that he shows up, even if he had a, little cha a few challenges, and for, for his inspiring, motivating, you really did what you, were, you set out to do, motivating remarks. Uh, Dr. Reynolds for his thought-provoking and eye-opening lecture. Thank you very much. Dr. Jolene Hampson for providing clarity and um, maybe opening up uh, uh, some cans, I wouldn't say it's worms, an added perspective, and you, the audience, for your attendance, your participation, and support. As you notice, we don't have to have a crowd. We just had some very interesting people, and uh, we need to thank ourselves for being here this evening, because I believe that you guys have it all in your minds, and we need now to work on the important issues, okay? So here we go. Um, we would also like to thank uh, our sponsors, Jacko Productions and Msol for making it all happen, and uh, Joel Enterprises, DBS, NTN, and the Office of the Viewfort South District representative for helping to sponsor the event. And with that said, I thank you very much. Tong Cheng. Okay. Mama, I like the why, why, the why encore, why, the why please for why. Thank you. I am a St. Lucian, yeah. That's who I am.